Yeah. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, and I know that it's the spirit of the Lord. There are sweet expressions on each face. Church of the Good Shepherd. Good morning. All of you sitting here and all of you at home on your TVs, watching on your computers, tablets, or phones, we welcome you to our midst. My name is Brenda Reynolds, and if you are visiting us here for the first or the second time, thank you for coming. If you don't mind standing and introducing yourself, we would love to meet you. Is there anyone on this side who's here for the first time or the second time? I understand there might be somebody <laughs> in the center. Well, we welcome all of you here and all of you out in the world watching us as well. Those celebrating birthdays this week are Pat Hollingsworth on the 10th, Megan Prinkley on the 11th, Kyle Worth on the 11th, Gloria Johnson on the 12th, and Maylee Moffat on the 15th. There are many announcements in the bulletin, and we encourage you to read them all for the details. But here are some of the highlights to pique your interest. And this first one is really a great one. We are collecting coupons for overseas military families again. Please save all of your manufacturer's coupons, not local stores, but the manufacturer's coupons so that we can donate them to the cause. There will be a congregational meeting on October 17th following the sanctuary service. Dr. Worth invites you to a new member's class on Sunday, October 17th. 
And if you're interested in joining the church, or if you are interested in finding more out about this church, he would love to have you come. And we're still looking for some people to fill cleaning positions. Fall church cleanup is Saturday, November 6th. So mark that on your calendars. Our streaming worship continues next week and forever via Facebook. <laughs> via, well, when I first thought I had to say it continues next week, it sounds like maybe it'll stop the following week. Uh, no, we will continue doing it. It's live at 1055 on Facebook, and it'll be on YouTube and the church website by 1 o'clock. Usually it's much sooner than that. Your tithes and offerings can be placed in the offertory baskets on Sunday mornings, mailed to the church, dropped off at the office, paid through your bank or by credit card at the church office. Now this is the one that I'm sure you're all aware of. Pumpkins are back. And uh, Diane and, and Bill and Bob and I sat there selling pumpkins. And when our replacements came, they said, have you been busy? I said, well, look at all those empty pallets. <laughs> we sold them all. You know? I said, now, if you believe that, I've got a bridge that I'd like to sell, too. But we want to thank all of the wonderful helpers that showed up to unload the pumpkins and to begin selling them. We appreciate everyone coming together to make this a success. Pumpkin sale shifts. Oh, that's hard to say fast. That's why I said it slowly. <laughs> Are still available. To sign up for your shift, please talk to or call Joanne Stewart or Kathy Dabney. Let us show our appreciation to them all. What does appreciation mean? It is the recognition and enjoyment of the good qualities of someone or something. It implies valuing, respect, cherishing, treasuring, admiration, regard, esteem, and high opinion. Having a full understanding of a situation requires acknowledgement, recognition, realization, knowledge, and awareness of what the individuals have been doing. Today is Pastor Appreciation Day, traditionally celebrated on the second Sunday in October. We on the committee also decided that we needed to honor all our volunteers without whom we could not succeed. So we will do just that for the next three Sundays. But today, it's all about our pastors. <laughs> Listen to the word from Daniel 12:3. Men and women who have lived wisely and well will shine brilliantly like the cloudless star-strewn night skies, and those who put others on the right path to life will glow like stars forever. Since we are going to be talking about Pastor Scott and Pastor Diane, we know that we will be biased. That is because we love them. We don't work with them every day, so we don't see firsthand what they do all the time. But we see the results of their work in our church and in our community. We see the fruits of their labor when they baptize, serve communion, lead the worship service, and counsel those who need their thoughtfulness. Thank God for them. We see it in the stacks of filled in prayer cards that they take home to pray over and follow up on. May God pour out his blessings on them. 
We see the fruits of their labor when we listen to the wonderful sermons they spend hours preparing and sharing with us every Sunday. May God continue to inspire them. But there are other times we see the result of their efforts that perhaps they really don't want us to see. We see it in their faces when they are tired, working on so many things that need attention, congregants needing their love and care, and not getting the sleep they need. Lord, give them strength. We see them comforting families who have suffered a loss. And we know that they listen to folks who don't have anything nice to say. <laughs> Just to get it off their chests. Yes, they listen humbly. Protect them, dear God. Chances are I have just described the daily lives of many, many pastors. Sometimes it's awesome to be a pastor. It is rewarding and fulfilling. It is incredible to spend one's life working in partnership with God. But it is not just awesome and incredible. Fulfilling and rewarding, though, it is hard. There is no set schedule. Days are difficult to come by. In order to be there for everyone else, it is tough for them to take care of themselves. To spiritually feed the flock, the pastors need to be well fed. Finding the time and opportunity for that is not easy and often means cutting time for recreation and relaxation, meals at home and even much needed sleep. 2020 had a huge impact on our pastors because of COVID. We were closed for months, communicating with the congregation virtually via Facebook and YouTube every Sunday. We had very little face-to-face -face interaction with other church members. This could have been an extremely negative experience. But because of the leadership of both Pastor Scott and Pastor Diane, our experience in 2020 became a positive one, allowing us to see the new and increased opportunities for us to reach people outside of our immediate congregation. We have people in all parts of the United States, Canada, and other countries all over the world, joining us every Sunday morning via Facebook and YouTube. And I might say hello to my sister. She's with us every Sunday. I probably shouldn't have said that, but I... I very often hear the person standing here says, a point of... Privilege. Privilege. I knew it started with a P. And a... It must have been a senior moment. It just escaped. <laughs> Point of privilege to say hi to my sister. We have learned that during times of high stress, there can be times that people turn to God in new and unique ways. We discovered a silver lining in that dark cloud called 2020. So to our senior pastor, let me share with you the following poem, and you as well. Our pastor, Scott, has a thankless job in many different ways. He gets a lot of helpful hints, but gets so little praise. The time he has is not his own. He's not like other men. Right when he thinks some time is his, there rings that phone again. Someone is sick of needs or needs advice and asks, him for, asks for him to call. And as God's man, they know he'll come and hardly mine at all. The wisdom of King Solomon 
is all he needs each day to lead his flock and keep them safe from Satan's cunning ways. Like Jesus, he prays for his sheep. Praise faith will never dim. But when we lift our prayers to God, how many pray for him? So let's be faithful to that one who helps us day by day. Let's not forget our man of God when we kneel down to pray. To both of our pastors, let me share this poem. Our God has sent you both to this place to lead us in the way that he would have us work and think and live from day to day. No matter the hour, whatever the need, you go the extra mile, always ready and willing to share a comforting thought and smile. We're grateful that you're here with us to teach us from his word, and we will try to do our best in service of our Lord. We thank you for your ministry, your guidance, and your care. His greatest blessings for your life is our most humble prayer. Now let us pray for our pastors and for church unity. Loving Lord Jesus, we are so blessed to have these pastors that you have brought to our congregation. Thank you for them and their families. We pray that as they faithfully deliver your word to us week by week, we will be encouraged to know that they are fulfilling your commission to go into all the world and teach the gospel in a very special way. Strengthen their walk with you, Lord, we pray, as they study the Bible and prepare to deliver the truth of Scripture to all of us that gather week by week to be fed from your word. And we pray that you would send them little encouragements from this congregation or other believers with whom they come in contact, as well as opening up the Scriptures more and more to their own understanding as we all seek to mature in the faith. Thank you, Lord, for our dear pastors. Amen. Amen. And at this time, Amy will step <coughs> forth and make a special presentation. Brenda. So there are many more cards that people have already uh, brought to the church and other gifts for both of our pastors. I do invite, um, I'm going to, you know, ceremonially give these to Pastor Scott and Diane, but I invite everybody to sign these cards if you haven't already after the church. And we also have some tasty treats to share with everybody as well after the church. So Scott and Diane, thank you from the whole congregation for everything that you do for us. Thank you. So thanks. And now, please stand and join your voices in the Apostles' Creed followed then by our opening hymn. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
seated, please. Thank you. <laughs> and God bless all of you. And God bless all of you that have helped me in uh, my ministry. Um, just one more thing that I promised that I would announce is the pink ribbons. This is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And the particular person who asked me to emphasize that um, if you are male or female, please go get a mammogram, or if you suspect you have something, go get a mammogram, consult with a doctor for yourself, and do it early. Do not wait. Please do not wait. We have a lot of our members that have been affected by this, either themselves or with their loved ones. Our entering confession. Trusting in God's mercy, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbors. Gracious God, we have sought after things, but we have not sought after you. We have expected generosity, but we have not shown generosity. We have not been gracious or grateful. We have failed to remember all that you have done. Forgive us and fill our hearts with gratitude. Help us to share our gifts and strengthen our legs so that we can run after you, God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. People of God, our sins are forgiven. We are reconciled to God. Let us therefore love one another with gratitude in our hearts and praise on our lips. Glory be to the Father and to many prayers today, um, so I will start prayers and uh, hopefully praises this week. Um, Randy, Sa Randy Samuel Colgan's grandma has stage three lung cancer and COPD. She has a very difficult procedure tomorrow, and I don't know who this is from, but we will pray for her. Gailey. Gailey. Ah, okay. Uh, Shauna Labrizi has gallstones and other uh, medical complications, and she hasn't been able to go to school much because of all of this. Uh, Melanie Parker has COVID. Bill Taylor, Karen Cooper's husband, had triple bypass surgery in September, but he's doing well. Bob Gold, a former member, passed away October 2nd, and his family was here last week for the service. And there will be a celebration of life for Bob Gold on December 11th here at this church. And more to follow as time gets closer. Diane, prayers for Diane and Tom Lang, Bobby Bauer's sister and brother-in-law. Tom has cancer and Diane Alzheimer's. Justin, Sue Clark's uh, friend's son, had brain surgery. And I don't have an update on him. He was awaiting results of uh, his... Good news thus far. Good news. Great. Super. Uh, Rob Paxton, Paxton's sister, Pat, broke her hip, and we prayed for her for that. She was recovering, and now she's taken a turn and is in, back in the hospital with complications. <laughs> uh, for Bill's and my daughter, Jennifer, for uh, test results tomorrow. Um, for those recovering from COVID and those who are grieving a loss from COVID, Continue prayers for the, all of those who are recovering from surgeries and procedures, and they all know who they are. For our shut-ins, and for those with cancer, Ann Voss, John Curry, Kenneth Waterbury, Brenda Fortin's brother Rocco, Kinsley, Danny Monk's niece, who's five years old, 
and Kathy McAndrew, who will finish her radiation treatments on October 20th. Yay, God. <laughs> and thank you for those, and you know who you are, who have been helping with Kathy and uh, transporting her to all of her treatments. Uh, God appreciates you. And now our prayer of intercession. Let us pray for the needs of the world, saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, who hears our cries and pities our groans, you are ever faithful. We welcome to you with our petitions. We will come, sorry, to you with our petitions for ourselves and our community. For our church and its leaders, that they be of open mind and open heart, that they might be the Christian leaders you have called them to be, and that the church be an instrument of love, justice, and peace. Lord, in your mercy. For our community and global community, that all may be peaceful, fair, and respectful of all peoples, no matter their religion, color, gender, or kind of government. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our local community, Lord, in your mercy, for those who are overlooked in our society, the poor, the young, the old, the bereaved, and the oppressed, help us to see them and to be with them. Lord, in your mercy, for the special intentions that we hold in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious and loving God, we know that you hear us and are always with us, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And now we pray the prayer that Christ taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. A point of privilege. Go Sox! <laughs>
Hi everybody, it's Miss Eleni here in person <laughs> with today's children's sermon. And today I'm, I'm f- advertising for free our pumpkin patch. <laughs> so go to the pumpkin patch and get a pumpkin. And when you go home, you can use your pumpkin as a prayer. And I'll show you how. So first you take the top off the pumpkin And you say, Lord, open my mind so I can learn new things about you. And then you're going to open the eyes. We did this in Kaya, so shout out to my my friends in Kaya for helping me carve this pumpkin. Then it says, pull out the seeds, actually. You pull out the seeds, we already did that. We say, remove the things in my life that don't please you. Forgive the wrong things I do and help me to forgive others. And then you remove the eyes. And you say, open my eyes to see the beauty you've made in the world around me. Then you take out the nose. And it says, I'm sorry for the times I've turned up my nose at the world around me. And then you're going to take out the mouth. This is going to be a challenge. Here's one piece. Here's the other piece. And it says... Let everything I say please you. And you're going to put a candle inside and say, Lord, help me show your light to others through the things I do. And then you have a (laughs) jack-o'-lantern. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for our friends and family. Thank you for our doctors and nurses. Thank you for our teachers and pastors. Please watch over those that are sick and hurt and help them find relief in you. Please watch over us and help us stay safe and healthy in making the right choices to come back to our church or our computer screens next week. Bye, everybody. I love you. Have a great week. Love you, Miss Elaine. Thank you. text for today is Exodus uh, chapter 16, verses 1 through 18, and I'll be getting to that reading in just a moment. Um, I would like to say, uh, it, David, give me a wave from the sound booth. I, if you can do it, at the very last song after the uh, sermon, I'd like to switch to Grace Like Rain, which I think is on our, okay? All right. Very good. Well, you can all be expectant as to that. Before our reading today, I need to give you a synopsis of the events of the Exodus between last week's reading and this week's reading. Last week, we found Moses at the burning bush. You remember God was calling him to be a part of God's work of releasing the descendants of Jacob, i.e. Israel, 
out of Egypt, out of slavery. Well, Moses does indeed go down into Egypt to confront Pharaoh as God called him. Quite an encounter ensues involving threats and demonstrations, plagues, a death angel. Eventually, deliverance does come. Pharaoh says, get out, and so Israel leaves. But soon after they left, Pharaoh changes his mind and pursues him with his armies in tow. And with Israel's back to the sea, they are just a bit nervous about the approaching forces. But God causes the waters to recede, and a pathway of dry land allows Israel to cross to the other side to escape that approaching army. Then when the waters retake that isthmus of dry land, it not only stops Egypt's army, it also leaves Israel only one direction to go, into the wilderness ahead. It is from this point that we enter our reading in Exodus chapter 16, starting in verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord. The whole congregation of the Israelites set out from Elam, and Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you. And each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way, I will test them whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quails came and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine, flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather as much of it as, uh, as each of you needs, an omar to a person according to the number of persons, all providing for those in their own tents. The Israelites did so, some gathering more, some less. But when they measured it with an omar, those who gathered much had nothing over, and those who gathered little had no shortage. They gathered as much as each of them needed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As some of you know, or will quickly be reminded of, the Hebrew word manna literally means and translates, what is it? 
It is a Hebrew question, manna. We will use that very question as we investigate some details in our story today. So Israel now stands before the wilderness. What is it, the wilderness? This portion of the wilderness is known as the wilderness of sin. Sounds ominous. With this loaded title, we need to say straight out, there is no relationship between the wilderness of sin and the English word sin, and we know as its meaning. This, has, this title has nothing to do with sinfulness. This is simply another untranslated Hebrew word. This time, a name, sin. Perhaps the wilderness of sin refers to an Arabian moon deity named sin. Or perhaps the S-I-N, uh, the first letters, uh, are representative of the area around Mount Sinai, which starts out S-I-N. This is the mountain to which the Israelites are heading. For our purposes today, the proper name of the wilderness is actually not particularly important, but divorcing this name from our English word sin is. The wilderness for Israel is a risk. It is an unknown commodity. It is the pathway to an unknown future. It has nothing to do uh, it has nothing to do with the proper name uh, of the area from the standpoint of sin. So what I want us all to notice now that the word sin is dispelled is that God's great act of deliverance does not lead directly to the promised land to which they are heading. The land promised by God to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob Instead, deliverance by God immediately leads to a time in the wilderness, which is not a time of sin, as we understand it, but merely wilderness. They're on a journey, and the wilderness is, the, is simply the only way forward, is to go through the wilderness. So it is here in the wilderness where God's people are called to journey. Here in the wilderness where faith is actually lived and perhaps learned. It is here in the wilderness where one must take a step forward despite the landscape being dry and inhospitable. It is here in the wilderness where one comes to realize you really can't make it on your own. It is here in the wilderness where faith in God is more than tested, it is formed. Even though Israel has already come to know Yahweh as the deliverer, in the wilderness, Israel will come to know God as the ongoing sustainer of life. This people, a group of ragtag slaves, have witnessed God's great power on their behalf. On their behalf over the ruling class, over Pharaoh, no less. Friends, this is a, a revolutionary act. In the, in the course of history, slaves are typically ignored, taken advantage of. Everyone thinks they know that gods do not act on behalf of slaves, but on behalf of kings and empires. But Yahweh, the great I Am, has turned the world and its expectations upside down. It was a dramatic exit from Egypt, miracle-filled and wondrous with a final escape from their captors through a pathway God made through the sea. Then God closed the way behind them, simultaneously destroying the pursuing Egyptian army while also blocking the pathway for Israel to consider a return to Egypt. There is now only one way to go, 
and that way is forward into the unknown wilderness. And so Israel steps forward, following God and Moses. Our reading today opens in the second month since the great escape. These folks are wandering in some of the most arid and barren real estate that they had seen. To survive, the people will need to learn to depend on God, and that is no easy lesson. Just as a baby learns to trust that her parents will feed her and care for her, the people of Israel need to learn trust in God. Their bodies were freed from slavery, but their hearts and their minds are still going to take some additional effort. It is perhaps easier to take Israel out of Egypt than it is to take Egypt out of Israel. The wilderness is both a literal place where they will set their feet and also a transformational place where they will learn how to become God followers. What is it, the wilderness, for us? Like Israel, God followers today not only experience rescue from captivity through God's divine hand in Christ, but we also enter a journey where we too have to learn how to become God followers. For Israel, it is during the wilderness wandering, and that was a long time. Forty years it will take them. Forty. Now, I'm not saying it will take you 40 years. I mean, the 40 years for Israel in the wilderness was so that one generation would pass away and a new generation would take its place. In other words, the 40 years in Israel's wandering was, in essence, a lifetime. So it won't take you 40 years for you to learn how to be a God follower. No, it will take you a lifetime. This life is our wilderness journey, which is a lifelong journey. The wilderness is our lives as we learn and grow and experience what it means to follow God as we all head in the general direction to where God is calling us to be. What is the wilderness for us? It is life. Life after the rescue of God. Life which has fundamentally changed and like Israel, we can't go back. We can't go back to slavery, to an earlier life, to a lack of ownership in our own future. No, that path is blocked. You see, the waters have rushed back in and closed that way. For we who have been saved can now only go forward, and that pathway is the wilderness of life. We journey it hoping it will lead us to the place to which God is calling. Our life takes place in the wilderness, and as with Israel, God will be with us all the way through. But even though Israel has the reality of rescue in their rearview mirror, the fact that they just experienced God bringing them out of slavery, even though they have the promise of land, which was promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to their descendants, who they are, even though they are certain God is with them. Trust is not something that comes easy for them. Verse 2 of our passage, the whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread, 
for you have brought us out of this out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. I now share with you an imagined conversation between two of Israel's own on this wilderness journey. Benjamin, remember when we were sitting on our front porch back in Egypt with a pot of meat to eat? Boy, Cato, that sounds good. Remember the lamb stew? Oh, or lamb on a skewer, a rare treat, but awesome. Oh, and remember the bread, loaves and loaves of it. I just love bread. You know, some of the elders say, man does not live by bread alone, but I darn near made it work for me. (laughs) Sure, we were slaves back then in Egypt, but at least we had food to eat. Now those were the good old days. What is it? Complaining. What is striking in this assaulting contrast of Israel complaining to Moses and Aaron is how this present anxiety so distorts the memory of the past. Egypt is known to be a place of deep abuse and heavy-handed oppression. Here, however, none of the oppression or abuse is mentioned. Only the existence of meat and bread in Egypt. Interesting choices, as we shall see. The distortion is perhaps understandable given the anxiety about survival. The immediate desire of food overrides any long-term hope for freedom and well-being. The desperate, fearful choice that Israel voices in this contrast is almost reminiscent of our brother Esau. Esau, who was willing to forego his birthright to his brother Jacob for the immediate satisfaction of a bowl of stew. It's just a poor choice. Reading this part of the narrative, it is easy to dismiss these former slaves as ungrateful or faithless. God has saved them, and here they are complaining. Indeed, a a form of the word complain appears six times in this narrative. It is clear they are complaining. Yet the biblical text does not condemn the people. Instead, God hears them and responds to their needs. We should do likewise and not be too quick to label them as ungrateful. After all, What would we do in their place? What is it complaining for us? Let's bring it home to us. Why do we sometimes do that, complain? One reason may be that we, like Israel, may have the propensity to romanticize the past, or parts of it anyway. How many here remember the good old days? Romanticizing the past, remembering things more favorably than perhaps they were, sometimes we do this as a defense mechanism in response to a less than desired present or even a perceived dangerous future. Memories, real or fanciful, can serve as a sort of mooring for our psyche even while we were on the precipice of an unknown journey or a difficult reality. And when we remember the good old days and hold those memories, and they rub up against some current challenge that we are facing, we, like Israel, have been known to complain. Now, let's not sell Israel too short. She does rejoice at the crossing of the Red Sea. Times of rejoicing and celebration are critical, but often that season is short. And immediately, thirst and hunger do loom large on the horizon for any human being. I don't blame them for murmuring. 
But this incident stands as a marquee for us today. So often we complain as we romantically remember how things used to be over and against how things are now. I guess what I'm pointing out is that as members of God's people, we are not perfectly happy all the time. God's people, in fact, have a long history of being complainers. Sometimes complainers want to go back to the way things used to be. But for Israel in our story today, and often for us, there is no road back. The Red Sea had closed, and the road behind it for Israel. And we must often turn our eyes forward as well. Why? Because that is the direction that God is leading us forward. God is not leading us backward. God is leading us forward. And in that forward leading, God meets us there to lead us. Verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven. Down to verse 15. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. God not only provided manna, God also provided quail for the people to eat. Meat and bread. Wait, wasn't that the very same items the people grumbled about earlier? Meat and bread? Yes, God provided what they needed. Quail was a known commodity to them, but manna, well, that was a different story. Never before had the children of Israel gone to sleep only to wake to breakfast bread appearing on the ground, just waiting to be collected by them. What is it? Manna. Repeat after me. What is it? What is it? Now say it in Hebrew. Manna. The word manna in Hebrew is a question. It means, what is it? Manna is literally a question. And here is the beauty of it. Even though we use this Hebrew question as a proper noun, the word manna still holds on to its roots as a question. A question which came fresh every morning to Israel. Fresh every morning. Manna, what is it? We spoke last week about the value of questions. As Moses asked questions of God there at the burning bush. What is it? That's a question. It is almost as if God wanted Israel to start each day with a question. What is it? The answer to that question is not manna. The question is manna. God arranges things so that God's people literally wake up each morning and are compelled to chew on a question. Manna. What is it? What is it? What is God doing with us? What is God trying to teach us? What does it all mean? So peculiar, so wondrous, so out of the realm of normality. Manna must remain a question. It must remain mysterious. Yet we all know the word must have become, well, an ordinary noun as it became in use. Oh, that's manna. As if something given miraculously by God could ever become mundane. Or can it? What is it, manna, for us? What is our manna that God invites us to chew on every day, yet we seldom give it any contemplation? 
Today, we don't have bread showing up each morning on our front lawns, but we do have something else, something akin to miracle food, which each of us now live in the wilderness of life. Today, we don't have bread falling from heaven, which only God could provide to a people walking through a wilderness. Today, we have something else that only God can provide. What is it? It is grace. Grace which rains down from God above. Grace which makes a way for us to survive the wilderness which we encounter. Grace which is worthy of our ponderings each and every morning. Grace which both pulls us to be grateful for its sustaining power and also calls us to take a step forward to accept who we actually are, God's people. Grace is the nourishment we need. It is also the empowerment for us to become. Manna, what is it for us? For me this week, it is the representation of God's grace, the unmerited favor of God to sustain God's people, to bolster us for our journey, a journey toward the promised land. It is the unearned gift of God which only God can give. That nourishment is not coming from any other source for us. And it reminds me of the provision that God has made for all of us. All of us walking through the wilderness of life. God's grace for all of us was God's son. Jesus is the manifestation of grace. The gift of God's son. The gift that only God could give. The gift that gives us life in the wilderness. And as we remember this gift of Jesus, do we not break bread to remember that gift? As we remember Jesus, his body, his blood, bread is what Jesus broke with his disciples to show us how to remember. I mean, for years and years, manna is the Hebrew question of what is it? In Jesus, that question is answered. What has come down from God to sustain us? What has provided a way through the wilderness of life? What can get us all the way to the promised land? It is Jesus, the bread of heaven. And Jesus is the grace which God has rained down. In the Gospel of John, John records Jesus saying this, In John 6, 51, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Friends, each time we celebrate communion, each time we share in the remembrance of the one hope we all have, We use bread. And I think it is appropriate to ask manna. I think it is appropriate to ask, what is it? What is it, manna, for us? It is grace through our Lord Jesus the Christ. We can look and we can look for another source of healing and restoration and nourishment, but we won't find one. We are in the wilderness of life, and the only lasting food around is God's freely given gift. We know this. Some of us have known this from our youth. And like Israel and their morning miracle of manna, we have lost the wonder of it. 
But friends, God's grace, like manna, is a gift every single day. Friends, Jesus is the manna in our wilderness. That gift of God, that gift of grace, is the only way we can make it through. Chew on that this day. Amen. And now, let us sing Grace Like Rain. I invite you to stand. The song may be new for some of you, but others will recognize it. Oh, I was thinking the wow music filled one. Oh, is that, is that going to happen? Okay, good. Israel journeyed 40 years in the wilderness. This is the one you can't play. <laughs> Just to talk a little bit about it, I guess um, this is like a redo of the amazing grace that we uh, may have grown up on if we grew up in the church. And this is a, a retake and a fresh take on it. I think it's Todd Agnew that is the singer, if I have that right. That's right. Very true. And 
Grace like rain is what God has given us through the gift of his son. It is something to chew on each and every day because that reality influences us through all day long. It influences the way we respond to others because we have been given such a precious gift which sustains us in the wilderness of life. Go from this place and know that God's grace is with you. Amen. Amen.